Okay, is everybody awake this morning? Alright, I was telling uh, see Robert and Gene. I was telling Robert and Gene that I have a three and a half year old at home and a five month old. So uh, my wife and I, you know, sleep a solid night's sleep that's I forget. I forget what it's like. <laughs> but uh but you're here. But I'm here. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh I like talking about all of this stuff. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, so last week we covered we covered some of the texts that deal with Israel's conquest of the Holy Land and whether we accept the account in Joshua that it was a complete and utter uh, conquest where Joshua and his people left no one, no Canaanites in the land, or whether we accept the the view of judges where uh, they, they put in a good effort, they made a good attempt, and then uh, ultimately they were not able to drive the people out. And they ended up living among the Canaanites. And when we bring the archaeological record into this conversation, what we found was that the archaeological record looks a little bit more like judges in the sense that the earliest Israelites from what we can tell, are hardly indistinguishable from surrounding Canaanite peoples in terms of their religious practices, in terms of their pottery, the pottery that they use, in terms of their architecture, these various things. So, we didn't get into the modern discussion last week. I was not, I'm not, I, I have a totally different thing playing today. And I spent a lot of time on that, so we're not going to ignore it. But uh, based on our conversations last week, is there any? What are you thinking in terms of the, in terms of the modern conflict? How about I will I will give a few moments to just sit with this a little bit, and uh, we can talk a little bit. What are you What are you thinking in light of what we discussed last week, and considering what happened on October seventh last year? Um, Hamas's attack on Israel, and then the six-month, uh, six-month military endeavor in Gaza. Thirty-two thousand Palestinians, maybe at this point. Uh, well, I've got a comment just from your title. It's hard to see it as a holy people or a holy man. Do you think? Oh, okay. So, just in general. Uh, just in general, where's the holiness? Okay, we're. Holiness is going to be a big part of the discussion today. Um, do you see modern Israel and ancient Israel as one and the same? No. Geographically, politically, all of the above. Well, if we want to talk about geographically, where are the boundaries? Even even modern Zionists. So I think um, Amy Jo Levine. Have you heard of Amy Jo Levine? She's, she's the only rabbi who's a New Testament scholar. She does a lot of great work. She, and yeah, as a rabbi, she's a Jew. So uh, she has a particular view of Zionism. And I will just say, as someone who has studied alongside primarily progressive rabbis and from progressive rabbis, there's no singular Zion, view of Zionism out there. There are different ways of thinking about it. And Zionism has taken different forms from the days of Theodore Herzl in the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, to what we see today and views of Zionism held among American Jews, um, which is less like, let's go in and take over everything. Uh, it's much more moderated. Uh, it takes its views from images in the prophetic material that you can read where Zion, that is Jerusalem, is a beacon it's a place where, and even in rabbinic literature from the second, third, fourth centuries, in rabbinic literature, Jerusalem is the shining beacon that's open to all peoples, all nations will eventually come to this place. Okay? Um, so, different views of Zionism. Geographically, Amy Jo Levine will, will admit, we don't, even if I say, I want to choose to live in this land, she'll say, I don't know what the boundary are, where do you draw the boundaries? So, other, yeah, other thoughts? I don't want to sit and talk about those all the whole time. I'm sorry, I wasn't here last, I wasn't here last week.
last Sunday, but I, I know um, just from the friends that I have that are Jewish, many of their parents went through the Holocaust, and I know from a study that, that at one time the land that is now Israel was promised to both both peoples. <laughs> yeah. Sorry <laughs> yeah, who was the land promised to? Who lived in the land? Who took over? Sure. Yep. Just, you know, thinking of last week until now, um, this is a, a land that has been continually occupied by traumatized people who transmit their trauma. It's in the Hebrew. Yeah. Yeah, I would say. I would say also that the text in the Old Testament, there's a whole. There's a whole area of scholarly research that brings modern trauma theory into conversation with the biblical text. And in the mid to late 90s, when that started as a, as a interdisciplinary conversation, it was focused on books like Lamentations, Jeremiah. And now we're at the point where most people say this entire thing is trauma literature. These are people who were traumatized, and this is this is them trying to work out what. What happened? How do we bring meaning and explanation to situations that are in its inexplicable? Sorry. I'll say yes. I completely uh, yes. And I want to add, it seems like we live in a culture of political extremism in this day and age, kind of worldwide. And I think that this is an, an additional manifestation of political extremism. Overly yeah. trauma, which is super interesting in a really hurtful way. Yes. And it's compounded. I mean, if we were to say we're in a super polarized society, let's pick an issue and figure out uh, how difficult it is. Oh, wait, let's just go to Israel Palestine. Like, it's one of the most fraught conversations. There are so many valencies uh, of difficulty that are in this that are in this situation. And we have to remember, uh, and I don't speak for everyone here, but for the most part. We are we're, we're outsiders looking in on this, and um, a lot of Americans are, are outsiders looking in on this situation. It's very yeah, it's very difficult. I do. Let's close this conversation by I, oh, one more brother. Sorry, you should read this. Why? He's got a microphone, but this is a Zoom that's uh, sponsored by Iowa Valley Presbytery on. Uh, what's it, what are they calling it? Uh, confronting Christian Zionism. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> confronting Christian Zionism. Uh, you want to be able to read the description? Yeah. Uh, let's see. The 216th General Assembly approved the active opposition by the PCUSA to Christian Zionism. Good for you. And the development of a plan to communicate the theological and political ramifications and agendas. In the mass media and among U.S. government officials, 20 years later, in 2024, our Palestinian partners are calling us to challenge a theology that reinforces and supports occupation, annexation, and apartheid. To learn more details and sign up. So the, the thing about Christian Zionism is it doesn't just hurt Palestinians. At the heart of Christian Zionism is that the Jewish people also have to cease to exist. Right. I mean. It's, it's, yeah, uh, yeah, so I wish that the description is a little more broad there. Uh, yeah, it's bad for Palestinians. It's also bad for Jewish people. It's bad biblical interpretation. It's bad theology in, in general. Um, <laughs> Could you define Zionism? I don't oh. know that, but. Okay, so Zion, at the heart of Zionism is the city of Jerusalem or Zion. As a, as a promised location, of, we'll start out as a location that is the center of whether it's Israelite or Judahite. If we're talking about the kingdom of Judah, Jerusalem was the capital of, of Judah, not the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, or modern day Israel. So that, that that is promised to the Jewish people. It is an eternal, uh, is an, it is an eternal promise to the Jewish people that that would be their place. I would say that Zionism, 
depending on which Jews you talk to today, Zionism can, can be on a spectrum of a geographic location to a theological idea or construct or just to a broader to a broader ethical principle maybe where I kind of hinted a little bit at the hospitality uh, of this being a place that yeah is for the Jews but it's open to all people um, so I, I don't have remarks prepared on Zionism this is off the top of my head so you should look into that further I'm going to encourage you to do that when I understand some of the more orthodox, very extreme orthodox Jews don't really believe in, in that kind of version of Zionism. Which version? Uh, the, the version that Israel is is like should be fighting with the Palestinians. Oh, okay. From what I understand, and they're like they're very insular and yeah. religious and focused and. They, there are conflicts within Israel because of this. And the way I understand it is that that, like many of them are having children that are like, like families are huge. So that population is growing. So there's like an internal conflict. Yeah. And yes, I, I'm not a specialist in this. All I will say is that Orthodox Jews are able to take that position of we shouldn't be we shouldn't be using the resources of the state to fight because they're able they're not threatened in any way they're able to say that and Israel has a mandatory uh, military participation for two years every citizen male and, man and woman participates in the Israel military for two years except except the Orthodox now that I've read in a couple of places that that's being debated. Uh, at the moment, but yeah, that's that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. That. Okay, Israel, the Israel that we're talking about, is not a one-to-one -one parallel to modern-day Israel. Let's let's close the conversation by admitting that and keep that in our keep that in our minds. So today we're going to be talking about a holy people and a holy land. The Riveting discussion of law in, in early Judaism. Why talk in, in ancient Israel, early Judaism? Why talk about this? Well, because as Christians, as Protestant Christians, we owe our heritage to this guy named Martin Luther and his colleagues. And what is the what is the main paradigm in Lutheranism? Law and grace. Law and grace, law and gospel. That's right. And as a Lutheran, I fundamentally reject that hermeneutic. I do not. I don't go and read the Bible without her in mind. And this idea of pitting law against grace or the gospel is, is an imposed, it's, it's a construct that you're imposing on the text. And does law come out looking very good in that framework? No, law is bad. And so ultimately, what I would say is that framework spawns and supports a long, terrible history of anti-Judaism in Christianity that we today are still subconsciously, it's just part of our, it's part of our beliefs, it's part of our theology. When I do these courses at Gethsemane Lutheran, when I do these courses, when I teach New Testament classes, I am always working to try to undo those, yeah, those, those beliefs that are just central to Christianity that that prompt up anti-Jewish stances. So sometime if I'm going to come back and talk about the New Testament, we can dive into that. I uh, can spend a long time on that. So that's why I want to I want to take a view of the law today and say, all right, let's put aside, let's put aside the assumptions about the law. And let's ask the question: what is the logic behind the law? There are 613 commandments in the Torah. Why are they there? What are they trying to do? Let's actually take this seriously. So to begin that discussion, I have a quote here from Shia Cohen uh, from his book, From the Maccabees to the Mishnah. So he's commenting, on, he's commenting on the Second Temple period, which predates our period, but it applies. 
In the eyes of the pagans of antiquity, the essence of religion was neither faith nor dogma, but action. Humanity was enjoined by the gods to perform certain acts and to refrain from certain acts. And these commandments and prohibitions, especially the prohibitions, constituted the essence of religio. The pervasive influence of Christianity on our thinking makes us equate religion with theology or faith. This equation is true, perhaps, for Christianity, but is false not only for the paganism, but also the Judaism of antiquity. So, religion is not about what you believe or about your faith. It is about what you do. It's about how you live. It's about how you order your life. So, how do you, and how do you do that? We're going to talk about this in the context of ancient Israel, but that's going to hopefully give you a foundation for even when you get to the New Testament text, you start looking at the way Jesus discusses the law, and the way that Paul discusses the law, which there's a spending month on that. Paul, yeah, yeah Paul the Apostle. Um, hopefully this gives you a foundation for how um, for how, how law factors into those conversations and how these figures in early Judaism even view the law. So, so this is good. Oh, yes. So, Judaism, Shavay, Shavay's environment, is it basically the same as it, you know, in terms of the laws? Well, no, the rules. not exactly. There are 613 commandments in the Old Testament or in the Torah. Those get expounded upon exponentially because that's the written Torah. In a Judaism, there's a concept called the oral Torah. And it's that there was there was an oral legislation that was passed down to the actual lesson to Moses and student to Aaron, who's a priest. And then he passes it on to the elders. He passes it on. And this tradition goes and goes and goes, and also the rabbis, you know, they're the ones who inherit it. all done verbally? Yes, it's an oral, it's an oral Torah. So this concept that you've got a written Torah and an oral Torah, that is today where you get. So there's the Mishnah, which is early rabbinic literature, and you have the Talmud, which is later rabbinic literature. And if you think about these as um, <coughs> You've got you've got the Torah, let's see, written. Okay. And then you have a later tradition of uh, let's see, Mishnah, and there's a whole bunch of Mishnah, Midrash, uh, yeah, a whole bunch a whole bunch of things. And then even on that, you have the later discussions in the Talmud. And you start, these essentially start with a commandment that's very short and nondescript. And then they spin off these wonderful legal conversations that go for pages and pages and pages. And the reason is because there's not a lot of description here in the Torah. So if you're going to take law seriously then, and it's going to govern your life, how do you make that happen? So you have these later discussions that are informed by the oral Torah, right? Well, how do you know how do you how do you generate uh, how do you generate an entire tractate of Sabbath legislation when Sabbath, although it's important in the in the in the Torah, it's what how do you observe Sabbath? That's not that is not laid out in the Torah. Where did these, so where did, where did these guys get that teaching? Oral Torah. There's a separate tradition that was handed down uh, handed down from Sinai. Okay, so to, yeah. I enjoy the rabbinic literature because in Christianity, when we have debates, I should say in historic Christianity, when we have debates, how do we settle them? We have a council with a bunch of powerful people who have authority, and they tell us, this is, this is what you're going to believe. This is it. You go to rabbinic literature, and you go, Rabbi so-and-so said this. Then Rabbi Shmuel or Samuel said this. All and then the house shaman, they say this, and it goes on like that, and then the debate fizzles out. It's like they just have this debate. They discuss it, they turn it, they turn it, they chew on it and chew on it for all it's worth, and then they just, you know, 
drawer. So the debate continues. So in Judaism, there's a fundamental difference between how you establish correct teaching or belief or correct action that's contrary to the way we do things in, in Christianity. And don't we have their leaders? Because then you decide. Well, sure. You, yeah, you can have various. Yeah, so then once you have the text, right, you have the discussions that are preserved and the debates preserved in the text that then later generations and rabbis get to say, well, this is the authoritative part. Oh, Oh. <laughs> okay, hold, hold up your questions really quick. I love the questions, but we are just, uh, uh, let's get, uh, let's, let's look at this a little bit. So, in Israel's world, the temple was the place where a deity resided, okay? And that's the center of your religious, your social, your cultural life. Most temples had images of the deity inside. You know this from, arche from archaeology. But Israel's God, of course, had no images. But the temple was still important. It's where God's presence resided. And since God is holy, the place in which God resides must be kept holy. The entire law is oriented around keeping impurity from violating this sacred space. Because once God's space is violated, once impurity has entered that space, the deity must evacuate. The deity must leave. So, holiness is not just a word that's thrown around. It's how you keep God present with you in your temple, residing among your people. So, how does Israel do this? Everything in the world is organized along two binaries. There's the holy or the profane, and there's the pure and the impure. Now, how does this work? Things that are holy are set aside for special use. Things like the temple, things like priests, things like the furniture in the temple, altars, ritual vessels like tongs, everything that's used to conduct the worship and the, and the sacrifices at the temple. The Sabbath is also a set-aside holy thing. I should also mention, uh, yeah, I want to mention this right away. All the laws that, that are in the, in the Old Testament, in the Torah, there's evidence of the similar kind of laws in surrounding Near Eastern culture, except for one thing. <clears throat> Sabbath. Sabbath is unique to Israelite law among <laughs> all the other law codes, the of the evidence that we have. So Sabbath features as an important part of this. The Sabbath is holy, right? Keep the Sabbath holy. Okay, that's not just a throwaway line. For us, that's a throwaway line. But if you're Jewish or if you're Israel, the Sabbath is holy. If you profane it, you've profaned something that belongs to God. That's not good. Things that are profane. This is from the Latin profanus, outside the temple. Uh, is everything that's not holy. Imagine that. Anything that's for secular or common use. And what I want to emphasize here is that this is not, it's not a bad thing. Something that's profane is not bad. It's people. It's things. It's animals. Everything that is not set aside for the temple or for holy use is profane. Okay? So we, we accept that. You know, this isn't like you know, profanity. Profane language, we think of that as bad. Profane is just, it's not holy. It doesn't get used in the temple. So that's one, that's one binary. The second is pure. Something that is pure is for ritual use. Something that is impure is unfit for ritual use. So, something that is pure could be uh, the clay pots. Your clay uh, earthenware that you keep. That can be pure or impure. The clothes you wear, they can be pure or impure. You as a person can be pure or impure. It, yeah, it also applies to human beings. In order to participate in the religious system, one must be pure. So you, we have to imagine, we have to think about the implications. And we, we can draw this to the New Testament in the way that Jesus confronts impurity and discusses impurity. 
individuals who have, who have taken on an impure state, which would fall under this, okay, a profane and impure state, cannot participate in a holy society. They are, they are on the outside of that. So the things that Jesus does by, um, by conducting exorcisms, by healing people, and that sort of thing, is not just, wow, that's a miracle, that's great. Jesus is giving these people back a state that allows them to participate in society, in a society of holy people. So it's much more than just, yeah, and, and he adds to this, of course, a spiritual dimension. Your sins are forgiven. Now, in a moment, we'll see why the moral dimension, why that's, uh, that's kind of a separate, <laughs> that's a separate thing. So, Keep in mind here, holy and pure are not synonymous, neither is profane and impure. You and I, we're profane. We can either be profane and pure, meaning we can be fit for uh, we can be fit for participation in a holy society, or we can be profane and impure, unfit. Things that are holy. A priest, a priest can be fit, a priest can be holy and pure and fit for, re, for religious use. A priest can also be holy and impure, unfit for religious use. You know what the Babylonians used to do to priests who they didn't want to serve in the religious cult anymore? They would cut off, well, they wouldn't kill them. They would just cut off their arm. Would cut off something that would render them permanently impure and useless to, uh, to the temple. So you can move back and forth between that state of purity and impurity. Now that you've lost your heart. Not if you lost your arm. Which then you get in, okay, even in, even in Israelite law, even in especially rabbinic law, you get into discussions in disability studies. Someone who is born uh, with a physical disability or even a mental disability, um, you know, they are, they are unfit for service. And, uh, you know, there's the rabbis, yeah, the rabbis have stratum, strata, of, uh, of fitness. Okay? The rabbis kind of expand upon that system. Um, which, let's be fair, Christians do the same thing. Right? We, human beings like to construct systems, and that's what we do. And we like to make those systems hierarchical in a lot of, in a lot of instances. Now, the thing to consider. We're talking about ritual impurity and moral impurity. Ritual impurity, for the most part, is cleansed through certain actions like washing and bathing for a period of quarantine, right? Why, why when you are impure, when a, when a illicit menstruation as part of the discussion, why is there a period that you're not, when you're supposed to come back from participation in society during that period, according to Israelite law? It's because you have a discharge a general discharge of blood or semen is a major source of impurity, according to priestly literature. And in general, in the ancient world, and I want to emphasize, we're not just talking about like one people and their set of laws. We're talking about common conceptions and ways of thinking about human beings and their fitness for participation in, um, in, in worship and in, in religion. So, general discharge of blood or semen Lepra, which is often improperly translated as leprosy. You can spend a whole class on that. Um, don't think about leprosy as a debilitating disease. Think of lepra. Think about that as something even as minor as a skin condition or psoriasis. Okay? It's not always this major. Leprosy has been made out to be something that it's not in our text. And we should stop translating lepra as leprosy. Again, that's another class. Bring me back sometime. <laughs> another source, another major source of impurity, corpses. Okay, that's why you have rules around uh, why a corpse needs to be buried quickly, why you don't touch a corpse, that sort of thing. All of these things render someone ritually impure. It's avoidable if you follow certain laws around sexual relations, around food laws around handling corpses. Ritual impurity, ritual 
sorry, did I say avoidable? Ritual impurity is unavoidable. They assume that it happens, right? Menstruation is a part of life. Discharge of semen is a part of life. If we take lepra to be something more of just a minor skin condition, that's going to be a part of life. It's not a debilitating disease that only comes to certain people. Handling of corpses, that has to happen. It's unavoidable. And that's why there are prescriptions for how you for how you get rid of it and how you can get out of that state of impurity. It's usually through bathing. It's through washing your clothes. It's through quarantine periods, right? And as soon as you do that, as soon as you follow the law and do what the law is saying, you come back to a state of ritual purity and you can participate. Ritual impurity is not viewed as an abomination. It's also not sinful. There is not a moral dimension to ritual impurity. Okay? It's a part of life. And here are the things you can do to make sure that you can regain a state of purity when those things happen. Moral impurity is another thing. Moral impurity is avoidable. You can choose to not murder somebody. Uh, moral impurity comes from an action. It's also non-communicable. If you are morally impure, you can't pass that on to someone. If you are ritually impure, though, that could be that could be transmitted from person to person. For moral impurity, that's where atonement theories come in and the sacrifice. That's why there are so many different sacrifices in the in in the Torah to remedy moral impurity. So you're not entirely a lost cause, right? You're not you're not entirely gone. But there are prescriptions in the law for doing this. It's regarded as an abomination. It's regarded as sinful. Okay? So, what I want to emphasize is that all of the judicial procedures, all of the agricultural laws that we find, all of the civil laws, all of the dietary practices, laws around how to observe a festival, how to observe the Sabbath, when we get there, all of the cultic practices around the temple and the priests, they constitute Israel's means for protecting the holy space which God resides, in which God resides among the people. Okay? So, laws around purity and impurity ensure that the holy space in which God resides does not become polluted, resulting in the necessity of God to abandon that space. Questions on that? Is God restricted just to that space? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. God resides in that space. There's no, what's the, okay, theology. Where do we get from, like, God is all, all around? What's the difference? Imminence. Yes, okay. Imminence. Yep. Uh, okay, my yeah, Bible scholar here. <laughs> um, imminence. Yeah, the idea that God is imminent uh, and, and, and around us, not restricted to a, a place. That's not, that's not yeah, a deity must, that, the importance of a temple, a deity must reside there. So then when you talk about how the Babylonians destroyed the temple, how the Romans destroyed the temple, how various Greek kings defiled the temple by Antiochus Epiphany IV, walked into the Jewish temple and erected a statue of Zeus in the temple, that's, you know, if you want to insult the people and really demean them and disrespect them, like that's, that's what you do. The practicality of the law in a chaotic world that's out of your control. Divine commandments provide actions that give you control. They provide order and security. Okay, So these laws, they're not superfluous, like Luther. They're not just a burden that's placed on people. They're actually, uh, they're actually a lifeline. They're actually viewed as something that's going to help you live a holy life and create a broader holy society. Well, the idea that a person communicates to God is a later idea. God communicates to you uh, through prophets. Okay? Or, like, yeah, yeah we'll, do, we'll leave it at that. By prophets. <laughs> and priests. Yeah. Priests are separate from prophets. 
Which is why Ezekiel is an interesting case, and Jeremiah, because they both come from priestly families, but they're also prophets. <coughs> Priests, for the most part, are a separate class. They perform the religious call, and they make sure everything is carried out properly. If you want to read, read, some of the, read some of the commandments in the Torah about how you do a sacrifice, how an animal is supposed to be prepared for sacrifice, how it is to be laid upon the altar, how its blood is supposed to be put in certain places, and all of this. The priests are the ones who have to know all of that. You as a person, well, you're in a state of moral impurity. Okay, I'm going to go purchase a goat, or I'm going to purchase a chicken or whatever. I'm going to take it to the temple, and I give it to the priests, and they're going to take care of it for me. You don't have to know that stuff. You just have to atone for whatever you've done. So... So goat's theology probably operates differently than that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yes. Ritually sacrifice uh, a human, maybe. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. So, yes. How come they don't get priests then? There's no temple. Okay. There's no temple. So there's no priests. Right. And the rabbis, okay. there's love. We up on that somewhere. <laughs> yeah. There's a... Uh, in the Mishnah, in the Talmud, there's lots of discussions about what the priests are supposed to do. And the irony is that these are rabbis who don't come from priestly families who are discussing what the priests are supposed to do. The rabbis are probably somewhat happy that the temple doesn't exist because now their authority just went, you know, way up. But they still, and this is how, this is the importance of text. Text not only describe the world as it is, but in text, you can also describe the world you want to see. So the rabbis are describing an ideal world, and there are places where they things that the priests are supposed to do are slightly different than what's in than what's in the Torah. And you, know, you can kind of see, I don't have any examples off the top of my head, but there are places where the rabbis are like kind of knocking the priests down a few notches in their importance in terms of their responsibilities. But we don't have priests, Jews do not have priests because there's no temple. But I don't know if there are temples. There are Jewish temples. Ah, okay. Various words. Temple, synagogue. Uh, synagogue is really, you know, when we say Jewish temple today, you're talking about, oh, this is a very long, yeah. In, in the, when your temple is destroyed, what we, what we see after the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 <coughs> CE is we have a lot of synagogues that pop up, local local synagogues that pop up. And so the authority and everything that happened at the temple gets spread out to at the synagogue at the local level. Um, and so today we call those, sometimes those are called temples. They're not, you know, this is not the temple. So um, animals aren't being sacrificed. Animals are not being sacrificed. There is one place where animals are still sacrificed. Samaria. Uh, the Samaritans still practice sacrifice to this day. But yeah, uh, when I was in Israel, Palestine, in college, you know, in seminary, we visited, uh, yeah, we went to Samaria. We talked to a priest, talked to a priest in Samaria. He was very old, very misogynistic. And yeah, um, <laughs> and he told us that he had a, a 3,000-year-old Bible. Of course, we were all like, can we see it? No. The Samaritans <laughs> never let anyone see their 3,000-year-old Torah. Um, okay. Now, what I was going to do today, you know, this, this series was, was titled Difficult Text, okay? Uh, we're going to get into Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13, which are part of the collection of clobber texts, um, anti-gay, anti-homosexual texts, that are in our Bible. We'll keep going a little bit. If we need to circle back to this next week, we can do that. Dietary laws. What's the reason? Just an example here. Uh, you shall not eat, right? This is what comes to mind. You shall not eat uh, from the pig, for it has hooves and has split hooves, but it does not chew the cub. It is unclean for you. Of their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcass you shall not touch. They are unclean for you. And the Hebrew word for unclean there is that um, ritually unfit, ritually impure. So by eating these things, you become ritually impure. Why? 
why these things and why why seafood? Okay, there's lots of theories about that. Some are that uh, this is about creating an ethnic identity. Last week we talked about how Israel emerges from surrounding cultures. So how do you distinguish yourself from the surrounding people that share the same genealogical stock as you do? You create laws that distinguish. But let's go to the archaeological record, which is what I love to do. The percentage of pig bones discovered at Israelite sites is only a fraction of that found at other Canaanite sites, particularly Philistine sites. Are the Philistines friends with the Israelites in the Bible? Absolutely not. Philistines had a monopoly on pigs, from what the archaeological record tells us. And economically, pigs are more expensive to feed. You can't put them out to pasture. They don't graze. You have to feed them. So, in terms of the economics of this, you either don't have access to pigs, or you have to communicate with your enemies to get access to them, and they're expensive to raise. Okay, So that's another way of viewing what might be behind this, and the same way that Israel did not control the Mediterranean coast. They did not have access to seafood, so it's prohibited in the Torah. Uh, they had access to things with gills and fins, which are fish, and fish are in you know, sources of fresh water, so they had those things. So this is just another, it's another way of looking at the laws there, in presenting this, I'm not trying to be anti-Jewish. My rabbinic uh, professors are the ones who brought this to my attention. Uh, they also tend to be fairly cynical about things. Um, but the idea that food laws are solely about creating identity, yeah, that's great. And if for modern Jews, if that's meaningful to you and how you practice your religion, right, that's, that's perfectly fine. There are things in each of our traditions that we find meaningful, that if we held up to scrutiny, it might be like, why are you doing this? Uh, it's meaningful to you. That rituals are meaningful. Um, so I don't say this to undermine what, what we call cash root uh, food laws, but just to say there's another way of viewing this. There's a practical reality on the ground that kind of points toward why, why aren't you allowed to eat this? Why aren't you allowed to eat seafood? Isn't this very much like the law? So yes, yes, yes. Same thing. Same, same thing. thing. You can, they yeah. can go to either store, actually. Yeah. And so there again, you're, it's a connection. Uh, yes, yes. Hal Halal, of course, is associated with Islam. Islam is so much. You know, of the three Abrahamic religions, Islam is the latest to come to the come on the scene. I'm not saying that to undermine it. I'm just saying we, they didn't at this time. At this time, they didn't have any bonuses. Um, my question was more like a practicality mm -hmm. because if you are fearful and you don't know how to raise pigs, they can actually be a tuberculosis. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that comes, comes into the discussions also. You know, all kinds of diseases. So if you're mm -hmm. not like practicing good animal science and chemistry, yes. then you can get a physical disease from that, which can cause. Yes, there are many modern scholarly discussions about food laws, but also like laws in the Torah that are basically, you know, ideas about germs and pathogens, that's not a factor. But as it turns out, these laws did like help with those things, okay? Washing yourself regularly and washing your clothes uh, regularly. These are, you know, these are good things that, uh, you know, although, although, uh, Although Israel wasn't like, this is how we prevent the spread of germs, it still, you know, is a helpful thing. And yeah, but avoiding pigs eliminates that possibility right there. Okay. All right, yeah, let's save this discussion for next week, okay? We're going to get into the discussions about uh, Leviticus 1822 and 2013 and there's a lot of recent scholarly discussions on how to understand these parts, these verses within the sexual laws of ancient Israel. So I will just yeah, I will give a disclaimer. You know, this is going to be an adult discussion. We have there's 
you can only discuss what's happening here if we're willing to uh, be adult about it. Uh, and you mentioned last week that you're all, you know, this is an educated congregation. You like to discuss these things, things in general, um, in an educated way. So that's what we're going to be doing next week, at least at the start of class. So we'll see what else we do next week. Are there, yeah, I was going to give an opening question. Are there any texts that you would like to discuss next week? I know I'm putting you on the spot. Does anything come to mind? I don't know if you want to leave it, if you want to put your email up there, maybe if you want to make their requests, or if you want to issue them to me, I can forward them to Joel. Whatever you want. I'll to put do. my email up here and then just erase it. When, whoever's the last person to leave the class, just take it down from the page. I want to suggest if you think you might want to email Joel something, take a quick picture with your phone and I'll be the last one out and we'll all erase it so that no one writes for a good time email. <laughs> I don't know who uses this space throughout the week, but. Understanding that if you email late, you know, you might not have yeah. to address that. And if you email sooner, you have a better chance of getting your passage addressed. Yeah, so there are, yeah, I mean, there are, we could focus on, we're going we're to do this, we'll do the discussion on Leviticus next week, and I assume that's going to take probably, that's a lot. yeah, this is going to take, this is a 20 to 30 minute conversation, depending on how much discussion we get with that. But then if there's a particular text, you know, you want to look at um, the sacrificing of Isaac, you know, Abraham and Isaac, look at that. Um, the Rape of Tamar by Brother Absalom, by Brother Ab Abner, Abner, yeah. Uh, in a David story, we do that. Yeah, there, there's no shortage of texts that we can just you know, take a look at and yeah, see what happens when we discuss them. Oh, well, the story of Dine is really interesting. Uh, yes, yeah, that's another way to go. Yeah. That's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so are we sticking with Testament you can send me New Testament suggestions. Um, you know, I can't discuss New Testament things, but I think this was built more as like Old Testament. My understanding was so. So yeah, all right. We'll adjourn for today. I'll hang around a little bit if you have questions. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.